Well, hi everyone. Well, thanks to a channel viewer, they suggest I look into this emergency closure or the sudden closure of a bridge from Lansing, Iowa to Wisconsin over the Mississippi River. They closed it May 17th, 2025 because of movement of the bridge piers, a deflection over an inch and a half. And this was apparently caused by adjacent construction associated with the replacement bridge. So there's various aspects of this story that I find interesting. So let's just go through it. So this is the Black Hawk Bridge. You can see the new bridge under construction. It's a 1930s vintage bridge that's being replaced. It's located, as I mentioned, near the town of Lansing, Iowa. Unfortunately, these folks have about a 60 mile detour now if they were planning on crossing that Black Hawk Bridge. Now this bridge was open June 17th, 1931. It carries two lanes, one in each direction. It's Iowa 9 and Wisconsin 82 are the highway designations. The bridge is described as a riveted cantilever through truss bridge and is apparently one of the more unusual designs of any Mississippi River bridge and only took two years to construct. Now you may not have heard that term before. A cantilever through truss bridge combines the principles of a cantilever bridge with a through truss design. Cantilever bridges use projecting beams or trusses anchored at one end, while the through truss bridges have their roadway located between the upper and lower cords of the trusses. So typically this design allows for very long spans. So here's some advantages and disadvantages of this type of design. Advantages I mentioned, some difficulties are with the construction. It's a more complicated construction and uh, the use of false work or temporary support can be difficult to establish. And this came from a 1968 study by HNTB. They were looking at a, a bridge replacement back then and they were looking at various design options. So this describes other structure types for a bridge options that they were looking at. Here's that 1968 report cover. They determined that the replacement costs would be $4.4 million. So in 1968, those dollars of today would be near 10 times that. So roughly $44 million. And the replacement contract was awarded back in 2023 for $140 million. And that's a common phenomenon. If you look at what it cost to build bridges years ago and even adjusting for inflation, current replacement costs are usually uh, triple what they would be adjusted for inflation back in the day. And there's several reasons for that. More regulations, uh, higher uh, design requirements compared to those requirements uh, may have been used in the past. But uh, it's, it's really shocking, I think. Now, this isn't the first time they closed the bridge. They closed it from February to April in 2024 because, again, apparently adjacent construction caused movement of the existing bridge piers. So this is the town of Lansing on the right bank of the Mississippi River. Population just under 1,000 and approximately 2,300 vehicles a day use that bridge. So you're talking about an outsized impact for a small community. As I mentioned, it's 60 mile detour. So this is a major, major impact to this local community having this bridge suddenly closed. Just some shots of the bridge. But you can see those long spans, which is good for navigation. And of course, Mississippi River has a lot of traffic for cargo and, and other navigation. Some really nice drone footage here. Now here's some footage of what it was like to cross the bridge when it was open. You can see that it's a steel great bridge deck and uh, those make a lot of noise as your tires go over. They're really fun to go over on a motorcycle, especially the first time. It's quite alarming actually because the ridges of the bridge deck catch the grooves of the tires and causes the bike to wobble back and forth. But if you just maintain a slow constant speed, you'll be fine. But getting close to the end here. Now I'm gonna run some segments from this news story. Pier three on the existing bridge had moved beyond our safety thresholds. Burke believes construction to replace the bridge had something to do with the shift. They were installing some piling for some temporary shoring towers that will support the truss of the new bridge. And while those piling were being installed, that's where we saw the movement on the monitoring system. Okay, so Pier 3 is the pier closest to the Wisconsin side. 
And when he's talking about shoring towers, there are these structures that are used on a temporary basis to support either uh, existing bridge decks or support the structure for the new bridge as it's being constructed. So as he mentioned, they were using vibratory hammers to install piling for the shoring towers, which is surprising to me that they would allow any vibrations in close proximity to that existing bridge. This article here references one and a half inches of deflection as well as settlement of that pier. And again, he's quoted as, we are vibrating piling for construction of the new bridge into the ground right next to Pier 3. Well, that seems like an extremely bad idea. I can tell you railroads are very much aware of this issue and uh, they're very stringent on the amount and type of construction vibrations that they allow adjacent to their existing bridges. Now, the prime contractor is Kramer North America out of Minnesota, and apparently they were using vibratory methods to install the casing for the drilled shafts. The new bridge, Pier 3, is going to be supported, or is supported now, with three 10-foot diameter, 120-foot long drilled shaft foundations. And apparently they used a large ICE uh, 110 driver extractor to install this casing, which if you look at the timing of the press releases and the timing of their work associated with installing this casing for the drill shafts, to me that is a direct correlation to what caused the problem in early 2024 that led to the closure of the existing bridge due to deflec deflection at the piers. Instead, they should have been using, I think, I mean, the, the drill shafts are in now, but they wouldn't have had this problem last year in all likelihood if they'd used a casing oscillator. And a casing oscillator pushes and twists the casing into place. There's no vibration, there's no impact. And again, typically railroads will specify or require this type of installation for drill shafts next to their bridges. By the way, all the references that I cite in this video, uh, there are links in the description if you want to check it out. So again, I'm just shocked that the DOT would allow vibratory construction methods in close proximity to this bridge. Reportedly, the bridge piers for the existing bridge consist of 50 foot long timber piles, so relatively shallow. And uh, again, I'm, I'm just really surprised here. I'll just show you uh, what a vibratory hammer looks like. In this case, they're installing sheet piling. And again, it, what I find, and I monitor vibrations at various construction sites quite often, impact installation of piling produces less ground vibration than vibratory installation. And also it's the frequency of the vibration from these types of hammers that is particularly problematic because it's under 30 Hertz. And lower frequency vibrations tend to travel a lot farther and do more damage than higher frequency vibrations. But this is this, uh, news release from ICE, their uh, pile hammer equipment manufacturer, and they talk about these nine and a half foot to 10 and a half foot diameter steel casings that were used for the installation of the drilled shafts for the replacement bridge foundations. And this is the hammer they use, ICE 110 driver extractor. So it's a massive hammer, and you can imagine it would generate a lot of ground vibration. Just a s excerpt from Iowa DOT press release talking about the foundations for Pier 3 for the new bridge. And this is what timber pile looked like. So it was basically a tree with the branches cut off and the tapered end on the bottom is, is driven into the ground. And the top of the pile is referred to as the butt. That's what contacts the hammer. So again, this is gonna be a real hardship for these people in this local community and those who travel into Wisconsin, uh, say to La Crosse. So I'll continue to follow the story. Again, I think reasonable precautions could have been taken to limit construction vibrations and instead led to the emergency closure of this bridge. To their credit, they were monitoring the movement of the bridge. So again, that's typically required on these railroad bridges. They limit the types of vibrations and the level of vibrations, but they also expect you to monitor their bridges to make sure everything's okay to provide early warning of a potential problem. So I'll continue to follow this story. It's been a while since I did a book review slash recommendation. Uh, thanks to a channel member, I recently read this book, Trapped Under the Sea. 
It's about the construction of a sewer outfall into the ocean, into Boston Harbor from the city of Boston. And unfortunately, two workers died tragically for something that shouldn't have happened to begin with. It was a very unsafe work environment. And you see this on projects on occasion where people are behind on schedule, they're concerned about costs. You may have ambitious, uh, can-do contractors who are confronted with a very challenging situation, which most construction is challenging in one way or the other. And you just get this feedback loop where people end up doing things that they shouldn't be doing. And unfortunately, these workers re were relying on a unproven, really untested uh, system for supplying oxygen. They were essentially hard hat diving, you know, 10 miles into this tunnel. And uh, it was it led to a tragic uh, death of two of the workers. So I think it's a very interesting book to get a perspective on what can happen on these major infrastructure projects if people aren't vigilant and careful. So if you want to check out this book, I've got an Amazon link in the description. With that, I want to send a shout out to those of you who've contributed to buy me a coffee. That's been a really good source of support for this channel. I also want to thank the channel members and those of you who provided super thanks. Again, I appreciate all forms of support on this channel. It allows me to expand my research into various topics. Uh, it allows me to commission drone flights in areas where uh, there's no local contact that I have that'll do it for me as a courtesy, like Josh in Rhode Island. He's been great uh, providing drone footage, but most other places I have to pay for that. So again, I want to thank all of you for your support, as well as those of you who have contributed comments to my various videos. So again, thanks very much. Please stay tuned for future videos.